to the next edition of Middleware Friday. I'm Kent Weir, and for January 27th, 2017, this is episode four. This is a continuation of the previous episode where we talked about cognitive services and the Face API. Instead of using logic apps to interact with the cognitive services API, today we're going to focus on using Microsoft Power Apps. In addition to the Power Apps and Cognitive Services content, we're also going to talk a little bit more in the Community Corner. So in this episode, we're going to talk about Azure SQL Database and in-memory performance. This feature has recently gone GA, and there were some important learnings that I, I discovered as I was writing an article for InfoQ about this, this particular topic. Next, we're going to talk about Azure Service Bus and what the future holds for the on-premise offering. Clemens Vasters recently wrote a blog post about this, so we're gonna dive into that. Diving right in, let's get into our feature content. As you may recall, and I'll link this up, in the previous episode, we talked about Uber and how Uber is using Cognitive Services Face API in order to validate or authenticate its drivers. So apparently there must have been some sort of fraudulent type activity going on where drivers may be using their reputation and allowing other people to drive underneath their profile, which created some privacy and security concerns. So they were using a mobile application in conjunction with Azure Cognitive Services to periodically challenge the driver to basically validate their identity. I was interested in you know, how difficult would this be to actually build this particular scenario. I went with Power Apps. I have a little bit of exposure with Power Apps. Um, I led a, a project earlier this past year and got to speak about it at Ignite. Uh, but in that particular application, I was the architect and more focused on the back-end integration as opposed to some of the front-end development. But I was curious to know just how hard would it be to actually build this type of functionality with Power Apps and Cognitive Services. Also, recently I was chatting with a friend here in Calgary who works in the energy industry and he was telling me about a, a scenario where they had some field workers who were gaming the system when it came to timesheets. And they were actually looking at some sort of biometric or you know, facial authentication uh, using some sort of technology that would actually validate or force an employee to prove that they are the one actually submitting the timesheet. So that kind of got me thinking, well, you know, Power Apps building a, a time entry sheet is, is a pretty good fit or pretty good use case for Power Apps as well. So, so maybe there's something here. So I went off on this journey to actually go ahead and build this. And the solution is illustrated on the screen. There's a combination of custom code that supports the solution and some out of the box API code available from Microsoft. Now, in the case of the custom API, what I found was I needed to upload images to blob storage. And as we discussed in the previous image, Cognitive Services API is, is looking for a URL of a particular image. It then gets ingested and the analysis is performed on it. Now, that wasn't out of the box, or at least not in my discovery. So I went ahead and, and was able to build this custom API. Uh, there's a great blog post by the Power Apps team, which is in our credits section that helped me do this. In addition, what I did find was the Cognitive Services API is currently in preview. And there's a few operations that aren't implemented. We, we talked a little bit about this in the Logic Apps episode previously, but I did run into some challenges uh, with Power Apps itself. So I had to implement some of these particular operations myself, or at least I had to wrap the API. I would say it's the connector that's currently in preview that doesn't expose all of these. Now, the bottom part of the screen with the SQL Azure database, in this case, I haven't gone ahead and implemented it, but that wouldn't be all that difficult if you did want to build that timesheet application. For the purpose of this episode, I'm really just focusing on the cognitive services side of it. Here, I've got a listing of all of the different operations that are used, as I mentioned on the previous screen. Some of them are out of the box. Some of them are custom. And with the Power App itself, we'll walk through each one of these APIs but it is good to know that there is a documentation page. I'll jump to that. And Microsoft's done a great job of documenting their APIs. If this looks familiar, uh, it should, probably should if you're into Azure API management, because there's they've really they're using API management under the hood 
and this is their developer console. Now with this developer console, as long as you have a cognitive services key, you can actually go ahead and call these different operations. And this resource was invaluable for me as I was working through all of the different scenarios. So we've got, we have a series of different operations. We need to create a person group, kind of like a container. We need to create a person. We need to add a face to a person or relate an image to a person. We then need to train that particular person group. So this is really where the artificial intelligence and machine learning comes into place, where the service will continue to learn based upon the data that's being fed to it. Now with the train personal group operation, it is an async operation, which means you need to call a subsequent get person training group status operation in order to detect the status. So these are two of the operations that aren't implemented. Perhaps that could be part of the reason why it's not out of the not included in the out of the box connector and requires some additional work. But uh, I don't know that for sure. It's just uh, some intuition. Next, there's a face detect where we can actually put an image in and actually get a face ID returned. And then we can pass that face ID into the face identify operation. And really what's going on here is that face ID is then going to be compared to all of the other images that exist in our catalog or in our person group. And if there's a match, we're gonna actually see the match and indicate a confidence score. Here's the swagger for the custom API that I've built. So we've got a post for our face when we need to actually go ahead and detect a face. We also have a person group, and this is really where we're going to do the training, where we can initiate training for a person group, and we can also get the status for that person group. And the last operation is the upload image. And this is how we're going to upload an image from Power Apps into Azure Blob Storage. Okay, demo time. Here's my Power App. Now remember, I come from a BizTalk background, so no judgment on the UI. The first thing that we need to do is to go ahead and create a person group. So I'm going to go in here. We'll, we'll call this Group 55. And then we'll go ahead and, and click the create person group ID. Now in this particular operation, there is no return value. So really what we're looking for is an error that would indicate that we actually have a problem. Back to the main menu. I'm going to go now create a person. Let's go and create Steph Jan. And by the way, Steph Jan will be a guest presenter next week. He's going to be talking about Azure serverless integration. So now we've created the person, we have a person ID. Next, we need to go ahead and add an image URL. So I've gone to Google, I'm just gonna copy the image, head back to Power Apps and paste that URL in. Now remember the Cognitive Services API, at least in this connector mode within Power Apps and Logic Apps is looking for a public URL that it can ingest the information from. At this point, we now have a persistent face ID that's in Cognitive Services for Steph Jan, but we now want to train our model. So we want Cognitive Services to really go in and inspect Steph Jan and understand the relationship. Now this is that asynchronous method that I talked about before. When you actually go ahead and call this for the first time, this operation for the first time, you're gonna get an in progress status. Now if you wanna see if it's done, you need to go ahead and check status and we can see that it has been succeeded. Now at this point, Steph Jan is in our library or in our container, our person group. Now obviously Steph Jan isn't here to actually go ahead and authenticate himself. But what I'm now gonna do is I'm going to try to log into the system using my own face and let's go ahead and see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and click the add picture button. I'll need to set the toggle. Here's my picture. I'm going to provide a name, Kent55, and we're going to take the picture. It'll now show up below in a gallery and I'm going to add image to face. When I go ahead and do this, 
it's actually uploading it to blob storage and we can now have a URL of my particular image in blob storage. Now we want to go ahead and relate my picture. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Now I have a persisted face ID. Now I'm not going to go ahead and train. I don't want to do that. But what I do want to do is I want to go ahead and try to authenticate myself. So first off, I have to create a face ID and relate the image. And now I can go ahead and try to authenticate. So it's going to go ahead and use the face ID. And let's go ahead and try to authenticate. We're going to make the call and basically there's no match. I'm not in the system, which, which makes sense. But what we can do is we can go ahead and add myself to the system. So we'll go create a person. In this case, it'll be Kent. Right, so we've got a new person ID. We're going to go ahead and add an image URL. So here's a picture that I'm going to upload. So we'll remove this URL and paste in this one. So now we have a persisted face ID. Let's go ahead and train the person group. And let's check the status. Okay, so we're good from that perspective. So now I'm actually in the system. So now let's go see if I can log in with myself. Take another picture, we'll call this dash two. It shows up in the gallery, we'll select it. We'll now go ahead and do a face detect with that particular image. And then let's go ahead and authenticate. That's a default value. So let's go ahead and authenticate. And there it is true. It's saying there's a 97% confidence that the image that's in the current person group is the same as the image that I just took and we tried to authenticate with. Okay, so that's really interesting. I think that's super powerful, super cool. You know, a few years ago or even a few months ago, there's no way I would ever even have thought of building an app like this. I wouldn't even know where to start. But let's, let's see just how kind of good this cognitive services is. Now, some of you may know, probably most of you don't know, but I have a twin brother. So here's a, a picture of him. His name's Kurt. So, so that's him, obviously, with a, a little less hair. But we're going to now go and see if there's a match between my twin brother and myself with me being registered in the system and him not being registered in the system. So back to our Power App. Let's go ahead and add an image URL. There, that's the new image. We've got a new persisted face ID. Let's, we don't want to train because we don't want to register it, but we want to do a face detect. So that's Kurt, face detect. And let's go see if we can authenticate. Let's clear out these values so there's no confusion. And we'll authenticate face. It's indicating true, there is a match, and the confidence factor is much lower. So initially, I wasn't quite sure what to think of this. Obviously, we share some very similar characteristics. We're identical twins. You know, cognitive services is definitely detecting a relationship. The confidence factor just happens to be lower. Now, in case you're wondering what constitutes a true match versus a false match, is you do indicate a confidence factor as part of your API call. The default is, is 50, 50% 50 or 0.5. So that's what I've been using for this demo. Obviously, if we were a little bit more concerned, we would actually raise that value up in order to enforce a higher level of confidence. As you saw, you know, between a, a picture of myself and a picture live of myself, you know, it was, it was pretty accurate, 97%. That concludes the, the demo. It was, it was a lot of fun to build. I'm not the most proficient Power Apps user just because I haven't spent as much time with it, but I was, uh, it was a lot of fun to go ahead and, and build a mobile application. And this does work on my phone. I have an iPhone, 
basically I go ahead and save it to the cloud, download the Power Apps application on my phone, go ahead and launch it, and it works. And so it's, it's fantastic. Hope you enjoyed that demo. It was a lot of fun building it. Next up, let's talk about community content. So this is a bit of a shameless plug, but it was interesting for me as I was writing the article, so I figured I would go ahead and share it with the rest of you. Because it is an opportunity to actually save some money when it comes to running your Azure SQL database workloads. So typically, or at least I guess in my experience, as soon as people start to run into some challenges with performance with Azure SQL database is they tend to scale up. And by doing so, they're adding additional costs. Now with using in-memory technologies as part of Azure SQL database, you may actually be able to reduce your costs and actually scale down by actually enabling in-memory objects. So this feature went generally available in November of 2016. And it's available in premium database tiers and provides performance improvements for OLTP, custom column store indexes, non-clustered column store indexes for hybrid transactional analytic processing. Now, Microsoft claims that you can expect up to 30% improved performance for OLTP and almost 100x for analytical workloads. Now, as part of my research, I ran into this episode of Data Exposed by Scott Klein and Horst de Bruyne. I hope I got that right. And they take an example of an IoT type scenario where they have meter reads. They're simulating a million meter reads, publishing telemetry to a SQL Azure database. And in this case, you can see there's some CPU and IO pressure when they do not have in-memory objects enabled. But when they go ahead and enable in-memory optimized objects, we can see there's a significant decrease in the CPU contention and log IO consumption. This might be a scenario where they could actually scale down and use fewer DTUs in order to get the performance that they want, which might be seem counterintuitive to the way a lot of people you know, approach this type of scale problem. And I thought this was an interesting quote, kind of aligns exactly with with um, with what I've been talking about. There's Mark Friedel, a solution architect at Quorum Business Solutions. And in their particular scenarios, this is exactly what they've done. They've been able to reduce their overall database throughput units, DTUs, that's really how you're measured from a SQL Azure perspective. They've been able to reduce those and actually reduce costs. And here's some uh, additional use cases that Microsoft has identified, including financial trading, gaming, certainly IoT, we talked about that, ASP.NET session state, TempDB replacement, and actually avoiding some expensive and slow ETL extract transform load processes. Next up, let's talk about the on-premise future of Windows Server Service Bus. Now this has been a, a free installation, I guess, it's been part of your Windows Server license and gives you PubSub capabilities on-prem without any additional licensing charges. Microsoft is going a different direction when it comes to this. And I felt it was worth calling out because people have give or take a year prior to um, this going off of mainstream support. Now there's, there's some people here, here's the date, will go out mainstream support on January 9th, 2018. Now, if you look at the comments of this article, there's, there's actually some people that are a little bit upset and they kind of feel like this is a surprise. And what Clemens, the author, calls out was that this is standard Microsoft support procedures, right? Whenever there's a particular product or server or feature that's released, there's typically a predefined lifetime for that set. And really what Clemens is doing is, is just calling that out, saying this is part of the regular Microsoft lifecycle policy. Ultimately, it's important for people to know that Microsoft will no longer deliver a Windows Server or Windows Client installable message broker outside of that context. The, the context being Azure Stack. Now, it looks like there's some future plans for PubSub messaging 
within Azure Stack. It's, it's hard to say exactly what that'll look. There hasn't been any public details released on that yet, but I figured it's worth calling out so that uh, people gain some additional awareness and can start to plan accordingly for this. I know for us, we do use both Azure Service Bus queues and topics, and we've been using Windows Server Service Bus queues and topics as well. From our perspective, our plan, like we have a zero data center strategy already, which involves us moving to the cloud. So for us, moving to premium messaging does make a lot of sense for us. It, it may not make sense for others, but this that's how we are planning to address this change. Uh, we, to be honest, we had plans to move to premium messaging prior anyways. And I think there's just some benefit in that approach regardless. So for us, we do have Windows Server Service Bus running on three nodes uh, per environment, right? So that's infrastructure that, that we're managing. And we're happy to essentially outsource that infrastructure, that compute to Microsoft and focus on really just messaging and PubSub. So for us, not a huge impact, but I want to give people a heads up. I know every organization is different, but I think the, the more time you have to prepare for this, the better. And that's what really why I bring it up in this episode. So feedback, continue to receive some, some good feedback. It's, it's hard to believe it's been four weeks already. It's been a lot of fun. I've been able to learn a lot. I hope you've been able to learn as well, but here's how you can find me. Thanks for watching. Also want to make a special call out to BizTalk360 for being a partner in this show. Uh, if you do have BizTalk or Service Bus monitoring needs, uh, please check them out. Lastly, let's talk about credits. So I mentioned earlier in the episode that the Power Apps team had delivered a blog post on how to upload images to Azure Blob Storage. It's a great blog post. It's from Pratap Ladhani. Hopefully I get that right. Uh, very simple, straightforward walkthrough, sample code, fantastic. Help me out, sped up the process big time, so thank you, Pratap. In addition, uh, here's the music credits, and we'll talk to you next week when we have Steph Jan talking about Azure serverless integration. Thank you. Mm -hmm.